Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Jennifer thornhill Verma, Director of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Welcome to the second webinar as part of a series of webinars that we're hosting as part of the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. I want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since the beginning, and we're broadcasting this webinar from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, and we recognize and deeply appreciate their connection to this place and the opportunity to gather here today. I'm Jen thornhill Verma, Senior Director here at CFHI. I'm joined today by my colleague and the Program Lead, Megan Sabian, uh, as well as Lindsay Yarrow, who you don't see on the screen, but has joined us as the new Senior Improvement Lead in the Innovation Challenges. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Uh, we also have an excellent lineup of guest speakers today. Allie Peckham is the Senior Research Officer, and Madeline King is the intern with the North American Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. They're back with us following excellent feedback we had from our June orientation webinar. And we're going to actually launch our call talking with Madeline and, and Allie. We're going to hear from a couple of team leads as well, so I'll introduce those in turn. And we've got our Director for Patient and Citizen Engagement, Carol Fancott, has joined us as well. So welcome, everybody. I also just want to recognize it's World Patient Safety Day. And a quick note that 134 million adverse events happen annually that lead to the death of 2.6 million people due to unsafe care. What we're really focusing here is on improvements in quality of care. Certainly that also impacts safety. If you can't get to the services that you need, if we can't intervene fast enough, it can lead to poor quality of care and certainly unsafe care. So I just wanted to mention that today. Moving on. If you haven't already done so, I see Carol and Allie had a great conversation. And Allie, yes, you're more than welcome to come to the studio here in Ottawa. If we'd known you were across the river, we would have invited you over. Um, folks, take an opportunity to introduce yourself. Are you part of the challenge? Are you interested in learning about the Priority Health Innovation Challenge? Do you have any burning questions for us? The Priority Health Innovation Challenge I'll talk a little bit more about, but it certainly focuses on improvements in access in mental health and addictions and improvements in access in home and community care. So do tell us as well as you introduce yourself which of those areas or both that you're interested in. The call today is available uh, through simultaneous interpretation in French. If you're currently participating in English but you'd prefer to hear and view the presentation in French, then you can let us know using the chat and our producers will help you out there. Uh, and if at any time you have questions, you can pose those in English or French and we will get to those throughout the course of the webinar. And if we, if we didn't get to them, we would follow up with you one-on-one -on -one following. In terms of the objectives for today's webinar, we're going to provide a really overview snapshot of the current participating teams. Uh, as of last week, we had 10. As of today, we have 11 participating teams. So the snapshot includes an overview of 10, but I'll try to reference the 11th team for our benefits. We're going to particularly look at indicators and populations that the teams are, are focused on improving care for. We're going to hear from the North American Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. We started that conversation in our last webinar on high-performing programs for care closer to home, and we're going to hear more from Allie and Madeline related to that. Um, we'll also hear a recap of the latest award opportunity. It's a mini challenge, and it relates to stakeholder engagement. So we thought we'd do a little bit of a cheat and hear from a couple of teams in terms of what your plans are for that mini challenge. And we're also on that theme. We're going to round out today's call hearing from Carol Fancott on engagement-capable environments. What does it look like when a system is designed to partner with patients and families and those, those impacted by healthcare improvements? So by way of a quick refresher, and for those newly joining us today, please do tell us if you are newly joining us today. The Priority Health Innovation Challenge, it identifies and grows promising innovations in two shared health priorities, as I've mentioned. There's more than 400,000 in awards available, uh, not to mention the networking and, and opportunity to learn from one another that, that comes as part of this innovation challenge. But there is money on the line available to recognize measurable progress against 12 indicators, six in each of home and community care and mental health and addiction services. 
and certainly by reaching more who stand to benefit, patients, caregivers, whomever the focus of the work that you're doing is. The challenge is also supported by 19 supporting organizations, and I think some of those are on the line today. Right, Megan? They are. We have eight that I'm seeing on the lines. So we've got CHCA, CADIS, CFPC, Healthcare CAN, Hello Colleen, Amanda from CFN, the Canadian Psychologist Association, um, of course Julie from the New Brunswick Association of Nursing Homes, and Nick from CMA, as well as some others coming on the line now. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you guys. We really appreciate your joining. That's another benefit. You have an opportunity to, to connect with and liaise with other folks in uh, Pan-Canadian health organizations, member-based organizations that many of you are already working with, but some may not be, and they're interested in learning about your innovations just as we are. So we know there are pockets of innovation in mental health and addictions services and home and community care across the country, and our hope is to really fill this map. So we've got some representation, particularly good in, in southern Ontario. We're going to add to this a, a team from Montreal who joined yesterday, Manitoba, um, Alberta, BC, but we'd like to round out this map, so tell your friends. We are going to get to telling you more about the latest award opportunity and how to register, but teams, we are continuing to recruit teams up until October 2020. So plenty of time to get involved. Um, so what we wanted to do was to start by telling you which of the indicators that teams are focusing on. And so what you see here is a quick overview of what those areas are. So this shows that there's five indicator areas that teams are working on. In fact, the team that joined us yesterday from the McGill University Health Center is actually focused on death at home, not in hospital. So that's uh, six indicators, three in each of the categories of home and community care, and three in mental health and addictions that teams are focused on. Um, and just to say that the green is the primary indicator for which a team is reporting. The blue is they, a team is additionally looking at, for example, caregiver distress, but they're going to be primarily reporting on one of the green indicators, but we'll still learn from, from the teams along each of these areas. So focusing in on home and community care in particular, we wanted to take a quick look at the patient populations that you're focused on. And so a couple of teams from Ontario and Alberta are looking at caregivers of all ages. Uh, then in Ontario, there's a team looking specifically at people at risk for COPD. And we know that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a major chronic disease reason for hospitalization and emergency department visits. Uh, so it certainly makes a lot of sense to target early onset COPD to help people stay at home, and then homebound seniors, the additional patient population that our McGill University Health Center new team is focused on is actually looking at patients with stage 4 lung cancer who present to MUHC at end of life. So nice, um, I think, diversity in terms of the demographics and, and reach there. Then when it comes to mental health and addictions indicators, uh, quite varied, so the catchment can be quite large in terms of an entire health region, uh, an entire province in some particular cases. Some are focused necessarily on youth. Of course, some of these indicators do focus on youth and, and adolescents. Um, but there's also adults, seniors, and different areas of the system as well as different uh, conditions. So for example, you see depression, anxiety in, in one particular area. In other cases, they're looking at sort of in community versus in hospital and acute. So we're working with each of you now on abstracts that we can share for all 11 teams. So that'll give you a better sense of what are the indicators, the patient population, but also what are the interventions that you're working on in these particular areas. We're going to hear from two teams later in the call from Alberta. So we actually chose two teams from Ontario just to give an example of some of the areas of innovation. This is, again, pretty high level, um, but through having these presentations from teams, you get to learn a little bit more about what each team is doing. So CBI Health, uh, which is actually one of the largest providers of community health care services in Canada, provides a range of services from rehabilitation services, nursing, physician services, and, and so forth. Um, they've developed what's called the Care for the Caregiver Program, and it's a three-tiered program that covers referral, self-management, um, and then it also initiates support for caregivers involved in enhanced palliative care, particularly in the Southwest Lynn and, and Erie St. Clair Lynn is where they're planning to spread 
in mental health and addictions. We've heard, I believe, from FAST team on the last call, if I remember correctly, but from Joseph Brandt Hospital in Burlington. Um, so an initiative that really looks at that transition and navigation access to services that aims to meet the, the sort of crisis level acute care needs, but with the goal of providing more appropriate and continuous primary community-based supports. So it's, both of these are really intended on um, providing services to either caregivers or those in need with mental health and addiction services at home and in community and care that I think follows and is continuous um, beyond that sort of initial healthcare introduction. So I think now we're going to turn it over to Allie and to Madeline. They're joining us to build off of what was presented at our last webinar. We had a great um, feedback from that particular session. And so we're going to continue on the same path, hearing about care closer to home, which of course is a topic we're all interested in. So I think I'm passing it over, Allie and Madeline, to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's a pleasure that we get to speak with you guys today. So I'm Allie Peckham. Uh, senior research officer out of the North American Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And I am Madeline King, a research assistant at the NAO and currently completing my Master's in Health Systems at the Telford School of Management. Excellent. So today uh, we will just quickly discuss what care closer to home means and how we conceptualize that. Then we'll share briefly the seven elements that seem to be associated with high-performing care programs uh, that are offering care closer to home. And then we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into two examples uh, that we've tried to start to apply this framework to. Um, really, so we have uh, done two, well, one rapid review for CFHI. Uh, we know the importance of offering care closer to home. But there was this gap in knowledge about the specific design elements that might be critical to provide care closer to home to meet the needs of, our, of Canadians and as well as desired system outcomes. So to, in order to address this gap, CFHI um, asked if we could can do a kind of a rapid review of the literature to see if there were any key elements that seemed to be associated with success. Uh, and when we were talking about uh, what it means to be successful in offering care closer to home, we looked at outcomes like maintain functional capacity, avoid unnecessary institutionalization, reduce readmission rates, maintain or reduce costs in growth or costs, and improve well-being satisfaction. Of course, uh, as well, patient and caregiver and provider experiences. So this is now on our website. So if you go to the North American Observatory website, you can find this under our rapid review section. And in addition, we have two other rapid reviews that will likely be posted within the next month or so. Uh, and one speaks to using technology to support home and community care in more rural areas, which commis was commissioned by the Nova Scotia government. And then we have another one coming out that's on strengthening home and community care service services for rural populations, and that was commissioned by the Yukon government. So I thought those might be of interest to you guys, so just wanted to flag that for you now. Okay. So in terms of what it is, what we mean when we say things like care closer to home, it's a, there's broad agreement, of course, that providing care closer to home is ideal, uh, but what this means can be quite variable. So what we, how we classify it is really just understanding that this is a shift from what might be considered a biomedical model, which is really focusing on the individual, a person, a provider, a body part, a sector, a building, uh, to more of a holistic approach to care and a holistic concept of care that's far more collaborative. And then the, we, I mean, as a result of the historical development of home and community care across the country, there has been a lot of variation in terms of what we have been doing. Uh, this leads to issues around access as well as equitability. However, it also allows for the opportunity of innovation. We are seeing a lot of innovation. Unfortunately, it's not always widespread and skilled uh, to meet the needs of every Canadian, but there are really great things happening across the board. So we're seeing uh, different ways we're using technology to support people more in rural and remote locations. How we fund people is changing, so we might even develop pockets of funding to give to family members to address uh, both health as well as social needs. 
We're seeing a lot of hub and spoke models, which is really interesting. And of course, there's this influx of interdisciplinary care where providers are now seemingly to rely on each other in terms of accountability for uh, their own clients and keep meeting their needs. So now I'm just going to pass it over to Madeline, who was incredibly instrumental in developing these seven factors associated with high-performing programs, and she'll just dive a little bit deeper into those. Thanks, Ali. So as Ali mentioned, through the rapid review, we identified seven core elements that appear to support the success of interventions that attempt to provide care closer to home. So these are outlined on this slide. And I'm not going to go into all of these, but I will touch on a few elements. So for example, factor three, which includes offering a range of program options and delivery methods. So these elements should include social supports, for example, transportation to group-based activities or patient incentives to attend programming, as well as self-management support such as one-on-one -on -one education or offering education on the resources available. Another example is factor five, which includes standardized clinical guidelines and protocols. And these should support care coordination, smooth care transitions, as well as inform healthcare provider decision making. So the next stage of this work is to apply this framework to existing models of care. And doing this, this framework can be used to identify high performing programs as well as identify strengths and, strengths and weaknesses and ultimately point out areas of improvement for existing models of care. So in order to do this, we took each factor and applied it to a scale, providing an example of what a high, medium, and low performing program would look like. So an example of this um, on, is up on the slide. We've used factor one, which is interventions that span over time with frequent visits from consistent care providers. So for this factor, we decided that a program that would be rated high would be an intervention that has no end date, all members of the care team are consistent, and visits from care providers are frequent, where on the other end of this scale, on the low rating, we have interventions that are targeted for eight months or less, there is rarely consistency across the care team, and visits from care providers are not frequent. So by providing examples of what each factor looks like on a high, medium, and low scale, we created an evaluation tool that could be applied to existing programs. So to verify this assessment tool, we've begun to try to apply it to existing models of care. Um, and as Ali mentioned, this research is still in its initial stages. And the research we have here on these programs only reflects information that's available um, on publicly available websites. So we chose the Paramedics and Palliative Care Collaborative from a list provided to us by the CFHI. Um, this program has paramedics in collaboration with other healthcare professionals providing palliative and end-of-life care. So as you can see, the program, according to our rating scale, um, fell mostly in the medium category. I'll go into a few of the factors here. So factor one, um, which is interventions that span over time with frequent visits from consistent care providers, we rated a medium as this intervention aims to provide care to clients who require palliative care. Care providers visit for an initial meeting as well as re when required. However, there was no information on how consistent the care team was. We also rated factor five a high. Um, so factor five is access, sorry, factor five is standardized clinical guidelines and protocols. So in this case, they have a training program for the paramedics in place that provides information on how to treat palliative clients, as well as when transfer to hospital is required, um, as well as they have a patient registry for communication in place that supports provider-to-provider -provider communication and facilitates care coordination. So another program that we selected from the list was the Inspired Collaborative. So this program equips patients to better manage their illnesses through action plans, phone calls after discharge, self-management education, as well as advanced care planning. 
So this program we also um, rated medium for many of the categories. Um, one of the areas of improvement that we identified was factor six, which is access to 24-7 support. So because this program only has a phone line available during business hours, we rated um, the program low on this factor and identified they could improve in this area. Um, an area of strength that we identified was factor seven um, because they have a well-integrated multidisciplinary team as part of the program. So I'm going to pass it back over to Ali, who's going to discuss some of the next steps associated with this research. Excellent. Thank you, Madeline. So really, this is quite an uh, awesome and exciting opportunity. It's more of like a QI type approach, uh, highlighting strengths and areas for potential improvement. Uh, and we want to continue to validate this framework to see if it is applicable and helpful to apply it in this way. Uh, so as Madeline mentioned, to date we've really only just relied primarily on publicly available information. And ideally, next steps would include actually having discussions with key stakeholders who are embedded within these programs to really understand the nuances of those programs that can sometimes kind of go or get lost when we're actually looking at the publicly available data. And of course, I just want to again thank you guys for having us speak with you today. And we're always open to having offline discussions and welcome you to reach out at any point if you want to engage in a discussion with us. Thank you so much. Thank you both for that excellent presentation and the excellent background uh, material. Folks, you have their contact information for Ali and Madeline. If you want to contact them directly, you can view and read this report on our website as well as the North American Observatory and Health Systems and Policies website. And I'll just mention the two examples, the paramedics, uh, palliative care at home, and inspired those were initiatives that, that we had provided to NAO. I know they looked across, and you'll see an example, particularly in the appendix, of, of other initiatives happening across the country. Um, but CFHI is invested in doing a lot of work in care closer to home. We have a system that predominantly accommodates hospital and physician care. And of course, that leaves a lot of people behind. It's a big reason why federal, provincial, and territorial governments landed on a need to improve access to home and community care, mental health, and addiction services. And I'll just say that on both of those programs, you can certainly le learn more on our website. Inspired, the journey working with the Inspired COPD outreach teams has been longer in the field, so more extensive information available. And I'll just say that in terms of the 24-7 access, originally that team in Halifax at the Nova Scotia Health Authority, rather, had had a 24-7 phone line available. And they found that actually only operating it during regular working hours was, was necessary. Also, when patients who are part of the Inspired COPD Outreach Program are admitted to hospital, for whatever reason, it could be for a uh, COPD or an alternative reason, the Inspired team is notified and that connection is made. Uh, I know that the Inspired team in Halifax has also used the Care Support Needs Assessment or CISNAT tool, which Jasneet um, has mentioned to us previously that's in use in Edmonton as well, a quite good tool for assessing care support needs and subsequently how we can help to service those needs. Um, so just a couple of additional points. Um, one of the questions we did receive was, will you have these slides available? Absolutely, yes. We make these webinars and its associated resources openly accessible, and so we'll get those to you. Any other questions, Meg, that came through? I don't think so. A couple comments there. Just a couple comments from Jasmine actually, who's going to be speaking shortly on the call, that they've begun an innovative practice in Edmonton's own home care services where they've integrated care of the elderly uh, physicians in home care to bring care closer to home with the mandate and objectives that is, that is being presented. So that framework will be useful. Glad to hear and hope that that framework and assessment approach could be beneficial for others doing work in home and community care. I'm going to turn it over now to Megan Sabian, who's going to give us an overview of the mini challenge that is currently open and underway. Great. Thank you, Jen. So we'll just spend the next few minutes going over the current award opportunity, that mini challenge number one, which is open to any participating challenge team until noon Eastern time this Friday, September 20th. So it's not too late, and that's why we want to spend just a bit of time going over that today. We've designed this award to provide for teams the opportunity to strike a plan for engaging key stakeholder groups, so you know, be it those senior administrators, those patient and family groups, physicians and other providers, community support workers, you name it, um, for achieving success related to your selected indicators. 
So in terms of the details really related to this award opportunity, teams can complete and submit through the challenge portal the engagement strategy for quality improvement template, which is provided by CFHI. Um, teams registered to the challenge will have access to this award opportunity and so forth upcoming. Um, and I'll share more details for those who still want to get in on this in a moment, as it's certainly not too late, with the deadline being this Friday, September 20th, noon time. The, the challenge portal is, of course, that same place you completed registration to the challenge, as well as have been possibly submitting your monthly and quarterly reporting on the indicators. So that same portal. When you sign in, that is what you'll see as your current opportunity related to the challenge that mini challenge number one. And of course, there's obviously some monetary incentive here. The top five teams for each category, so be it in mental health and addiction services or home and community care, will receive an award of $10,000, which can be applied to your work as you see fit. Ideally, toward engagement. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So what I wanted to just capture over the next few slides are essentially screenshots of what the template looks like, just to give you an idea of what we're looking for. So here on your screen right now, you're seeing um, the instructions for completion, which includes guidelines and definitions to assist teams in knowing how best to go about completing their plan. And then for part one, the creation of the strategy itself, these are the parameters. So it's, think of it as a table, a template that you'll complete for identifying those key stakeholder groups that are key to success of your initiative and breaking down the details on things like potential barriers to their engagement, key messages and anticipated outcomes, the role that they could play, and key strategies that you'll use for involving them. And then the second part, of the template is more of an essay style where we're going to ask teams to reflect on how the dollars for this award opportunity would be used to further the engagement strategy that they've created. So teams here will want to consider who they would want to engage as a first priority and the strategies that they would employ to engage them along with the rationale for their selection for advancing their primary outcomes indicator. And here on your screen, you'll see the term, so more or less the legalese that goes out um, kind of guiding the parameters around the, the, the award opportunity. So these are available on our website. They accompany the template for completion. And this gives you up front the reporting grid that the judges or the reviewers will use to evaluate the submissions that come in and determine who the recipients are. We would fully recommend reviewing these criteria in full as you complete the template because it's there for you to do just that. And finally, as an important feature that we have with the Priority Health Challenge, as Jen mentioned at the onset of this webinar, teams can register at any time up to the close of October 2020. So what that means right now is it's not too late to get in on this award opportunity. Registration is simple, takes about 10, 15 minutes to complete via the link that you're seeing on your screen in blue. And not only will you have access to this award opportunity, as I mentioned, but several more upcoming over the next year as well. So well now, we're now, I think, going to turn it back over mm -hmm. to Jen, who's going to introduce a couple of teams to walk us through what they're actually doing by way of this mini-challenge opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Um, so just a reminder, as Megan said, we are welcoming registration. I noticed a, about a half dozen of you who are new to the line, just in terms of your names and organizations. Lindsay, who's our new senior improvement leader, is actually sending you each a quick little sidebar note to say, glad you joined us today. We'd love to follow up with you post-webinar to discuss if this is a, a fit for you. And we continue to recruit teams right up to October 2020 to learn more about your improvements in access in home and community care and mental health and addictions. Improvement, as we know, is a team sport. And if you do not involve those who will be affected and influenced by these interventions um, in deciding, you know, A, what those interventions are and how they're going to roll out, you're going to be up a particular creek without a steady paddle. Um, so that was why we wanted to design this first mini challenge around engagement. And we're going to focus the remainder of our call on exactly that. So I think, Megan, we're going to skip ahead to the next slide. And the first team we're going to hear from, we're going to hear from Jackie. She's the program manager of the Health Home Community Program with the Calgary Foothills Primary Care Network to tell us what you've got 
set for your stakeholder engagement plan. Jackie. Great, hoping everyone can hear me there on the line. So okay. um, I'm Jackie Offens. You can hear me? Yes. Great. So I'm Jackie, and I'm representing the Calgary Foothills Primary Care Network. I'm joined here as well by Yolanda, who's worked hard with me on this, and so I want to acknowledge that. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about our engagement plan for a new model that we've been testing um, called Case Collaborative. And this model is really an opportunity to bring together intersectoral partners. So we have um, AHS services, mental health services embedded, Alberta Health Services, um, nonprofit social service agencies, family physicians and allied health teams, patients and families obviously in the center, and we even have schools that are on these case collaborative models. And essentially we come together about once or twice a month and to discuss um, more complex cases and situations, and we get the input from the professionals and the patient and family if they're present in the room. And this really allows us to create a comprehensive care plan, either by coordinating care between organizations that are already involved, or connecting patients to new services in a really coordinated and sort of warm handoff type fashion. Um, and we've been testing this model in Cochrane. So the model is the same, but we've been testing them with two populations. So in Cochrane, it's with children and youth. And then in Bowness, we've been testing it in Calgary with older adults. And so far, collectively, we've seen over 60 cases. Um, and our qualitative results so far have been quite positive, um, but we were really excited about this challenge for a few different reasons, and I think our engagement strategy really allowed us to focus our uh, efforts in two main areas. So first being a really robust communication strategy and a little bit around our evaluation strategy as well. So one of the key factors in making this model work is making sure that all of the stakeholders are actually at the table that are involved in a person's uh, care. So while we've really consistently had a core group of individuals who come to the table each month, there have been some gaps in representation from certain stakeholders. And I picked one of those stakeholders to speak to today, but of course there's many others we'd love to get to at some point. So um, today I'm going to focus on our family physicians uh, to really highlight some of the key aspects of our engagement plan. In our current state, only about 11% of physicians in Cochrane and the Bowness area are actually accessing the case collaborative tables. And we see family physicians as being such a critical stakeholder because they really play such a big role in the care for the patient. Um, they can provide expertise and insight regarding the patient's family history, their current circumstance, their medical history, and they also give a lot of great insight into the future goals for that patient. Um, and we see them as being a huge connector for patients to specialty care and long-term support as well. And one of the things we've been recognizing in our collaborative is there isn't always a recognition from some of our partners at the table either about the scope of what the family physician's role can be and what all the things that they can manage in the health home and what they can offer in that range as well. So in our engagement plan, we identified family docs as a direct stakeholder that's likely to support. They play the role of advocate, evidence, support, and guidance. Some of the key barriers that we identified in our plan was that family docs are not always aware that the case collaborative table even exists at this point, um, but even more than awareness is that we're not sure that they really understand the value of them yet. And that's really why I put this quote around stories up here, because in order to really explain this model, we need to be able to communicate it through stories and make it relevant around how this can apply in practice. So instead of my spiel around, you know, this is an intersectoral partnership with all these different partners, it's saying this is how we've um, helped people in the past and this is the impact it can make to connecting people to the right resources, the right providers at the right time, and making sure that it's coordinated and really um, a well-oiled machine. Um, so one of our key messages to family physicians is that this can really create an opportunity to connect with other providers that are involved or could be involved that are outside of the family physician's office. And we hope um, with this engagement to be able to create a video testimonial to demonstrate that through um, just how useful these case collaborators can be. And we have you know, physicians that could speak to that. We have patients that can speak to that. We have partners in our other sectors that can speak, uh, speak to that as well and can highlight how this model helps with navigation and access to services 
uh, in mental health and addictions. And then, you know, in the broader context as well, when we talk about holistic care, it's also beyond those services. The last thing I'll sort of speak to is um, another piece of the engagement plan, which is really around collecting data and telling that story through some di by using some different evaluation tools. So obviously we need to ensure that we're always measuring impact and adjusting through some of those process um, pieces, but also looking at some of the outcome engagement strategies. Um, so being able to tell that story from an outcome perspective as well with that data. And so after going through the engagement plan exercise, um, the need for telling the story became super clear to us, and we hope to use some different communication tools, including the video testimonial that I spoke about, to increase the presence of this case collaborative model in our communities through physicians um, targeted at family physicians, but we also see the opportunity to use this to engage a variety of other stakeholders, including patients and their families as well. So that's all I have for today. Jackie, thank you so much. That is super helpful, very insightful. And for those who may have just joined the line, uh, Jackie from Calgary Foothills Primary Care and team shared uh, some of the inside scoop around the development of their stakeholder engagement strategy for their work. Uh, in improving care in, in home and community care. And just want to reference a couple of high-level things that, that Jackie had said. You know, it's not enough to do the improvement work or evaluate it. You also have to talk about it. And so that focus on communication and evaluation and asking, you know, is what we're doing delivering what we thought it would? And if not, why not? And thinking about how to reach your audience is really critical. And I think the other thing that that, that Jackie had said, all of which was very valuable, is sort of that focus on story, that the data can sometimes be difficult to comprehend, or maybe you don't have enough data points to be able to demonstrate trending. But the plural of anecdote, as we know, is often policy and, and, and practice change. We can understand when we think about it from the lens of a, a patient or a caregiver. We're going to now hear from Jasmine Primer, the Medical Director of Covenant Health Network of Excellence in Seniors Health and Wellness, and Anita Murphy, the Director of Home Living and Continuing Care Edmonton Zone. They've been having some chat back and forth in the chat box, and we'll hear about some of the inside scoop of their stakeholder engagement strategy. So I think I'm turning over to Jasmine. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> I, I do also uh, represent, um, I am involved with Covenant Health. I should let you know that I stepped down as the Medical Director for Covenant Health Network of Excellence in Seniors Health and Wellness as of end of August. Uh, it was a, a secondment, <laughs> six years. And basically, my team said, okay, the secondment needs to come to an end. However, I remain the medical lead for Edmonton Zone. Uh, this is Alberta Health Services, uh, home care and transitions. And it is in that capacity I continue this work, though I still have the support of the Covenant Health Seniors Network in research and um, also partnering with uh, as a collaborator in all the work that I'm doing to advance care of seniors in the community. So uh, moving on. <clears throat> To the next slide. Thank you. I wasn't quite sure how to advance it. I was told how to do it. There was supposed to be an arrow at the bottom. I can't find it now. So thank you so much for doing that for me. So I'm here to speak about the Edmonton Zone Enhanced Home Living Clients and Caregiver Supports. Uh, uh, initiative, which was in a pilot stage, and now it's going to be rolled out across home living. Uh, Anita Murphy is my dyad and fully aware of what I'm presenting today, and Sharon Anderson is online, and she is our research coordinator. Moving on. I'm quite, oh, there, I see the arrows now. There you go. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go back one. There you are. Thank you. So uh, you um, at, at our first presentation, uh, we had expected some challenges which are outlined here and where our team uh, might need more support. And um, uh, uh, some of these things have arisen as we monitor the progress of this pilot. And definitely education and skill development rose to the surface surface, um, particularly around uh, uh, assessing uh, support needs for clients and caregivers, and uh, using the tool that we have introduced, CISNAT, appropriately. Um, and also, uh, we needed, uh, uh, the, the staff needed, uh, um, the whole process needed organizational support, support. However, the staff also, uh, while they recognized the importance of this work, uh, were looking 
for um, confidence and sustainability, which again goes back to organization support. I'm going to move this forward. Right. So what we decide, and you're going to see a fairly expansive uh, stakeholder engagement plan from us, uh, which is, um, as we roll this out, as you can imagine, we have to engage the frontline staff from all our five networks, including the program managers, etc. And we are ready to do that. We have actually considerable organization support from within home care. We are also going to be engaging transition coordinators and system case managers from home care as they work on bringing people home safely. So making sure, and I'm looking at all your other outcome indicators, and we fulfill almost this part, initiative fulfills almost all of them. Though we have focused on health and well-being of caregivers, i.e. reducing their distress, as well as giving them a real um, a choice to stay, uh, giving the clients a, uh, a real choice to stay at home with the support of caregivers. So in, in our stakeholder engagement, as I was mentioning, so from acute care as people are being identified to be um, uh, and, and receive support at discharge, we need to engage the transition coordinators and system case managers with this um, uh, work as well as the education that's required. Uh, and I'll go into that in a moment. We are also engaging in the community as we recognize that not only we need to bring people home, we also help, we need to support them to stay at home and wait at home. And, oh, and, and furthermore, we are trying to avoid unnecessary hospitalization. So um, we are now focused also in using this initiative in helping uh, through system case managers in the community, um, uh, fam engaging family physicians and the care of the elderly physicians that I just mentioned um, who are being uh, integrated into home care uh, to help us. Uh, support people who are deteriorating in the community. Absolutely, we are needing organization support. So our next stakeholder engagement will be wider uh, engagement of organizational leads and policy um, lead leaders, which includes not only from within healthcare system, uh, Alberta Healthcare Services, uh, and contracted partners such as Covenant Health, but also uh, Alberta Health and Seniors, um, uh, gov another government um, department, uh, Seniors and Housing. We are engaging, we are in the process of engaging community organizations, and you will see in this uh, next slide that we have engaged them in ongoing work around education with CISNAT. Um, and finally, we are using um, other resources to bring academics and researchers into this work so we can continue to study them, so we are applying for grants. Communication has come up, and we are engaging various uh, means of communication um, to, to promote, uh, and we, we have quite a few now in the works to, to, uh, to message around and, and create a story uh, and um, provide um, real-life examples on the work that's ongoing. So the key strategy I'm going to present today, it's actually very intentional and a bit painstaking. It's, we, we, went, we, we identified that we need to, to educate the, the staff on, on a, <clears throat> a very key area, which is sort of, I would like to think, a breakthrough step in, in this work. And that is a, a client-led and a caregiver-led support needs assessment. And I have mentioned this not before. However, we felt that the online education that the staff were taking voluntarily or the education we were providing through our lectures and, and PowerPoint presentation was not adequate. So we engaged the, the authors of these, um, uh, of, of uh, CISNAD, Professor Gunn Grant and Dr. Gay Ewing, and brought them to uh, Alberta. We also engaged Dr. Murad Fakwar, who is the author of SNAP, which is the patient-led support, uh, support needs assessment, because we have realized they both go hand in hand. And in fact, we learned when, we, when these professors and, uh, came down to Edmonton and held two workshops for us, one in Edmonton and one in Calgary, and trained the trainers. And we trained about 60 people. And what we did was we were quite intentional. We did not limit it to home care. We actually asked for representation from other um, uh, uh, streams of uh, uh, healthcare system as well as community co organization. And the reason we did that was because we need others to understand and also hopefully use the same assessment tools as well as speak common language. And we were successful in getting people from, um, and these are champions identified by 
um, directors, program managers, and, and policy leads. And they came from acute care, they came from supportive living, they came from um, primary care, they came from community organizations, they came from long-term care besides home care. So with with the with the workshops they held, they actually went through two units. So the first unit is about that individual le level training, so they understand the CISNAT approach. And, um, and, and I cannot tell you, and I took the training myself, what a difference it made to learn from uh, the people who, who created this, because actually there's quite a few misunderstandings if you try to use this approach without full, full understanding of what this approach is about. And it also helped us all recognize the importance of this work, and we've got fabulous feedback from the 60 people who were trained to do it. Um, and then there was a learning unit too, because what they did was train the trainer. So the afternoon they spent on how to work at that organizational level and bring about that culture change and um, look at sustaining implementation. So these champions then can go out and help us not only train others, but also um, uh, uh, bring about that organization support that we need. Um, so in, in this process, we caught them also to present to, um, at a meeting, present to um, policy leads and directors, etc. And we also took this opportunity to have them present at Caregivers Alberta because you're actually putting this tool into the hands of clients if it's SNAP and uh, caregivers if it's CISNAP. So it was very useful to do a town hall where caregivers could come and see what these tools were about because they get a chance to reflect on their needs and then have a facilitated discussion with the with the healthcare uh, providers or care providers in community organizations. So I'm going to have you move forward and just tell you what we plan to do, especially if we get this award. So I'm sorry, I, sh I can do this myself. There you go. So we are using the ADCOR approach. So what we've done already is bring about this awareness, and we've held this workshop, um, um, as I mentioned, from um, both in uh, uh, Calgary and Edmonton, but it covered all five zones, so there were representatives from across Alberta. And while we speak, there are interviews going on now with the frontline staff, and the, this is in the pilot project, and Sharon Anderson is just mentioning some of the quotes that are coming out of these interviews. So we are holding focus group with the people who've actually uh, been part of this uh, pilot project to learn about uh, the strengths and limitations as well as um, the challenges they had with the CISNAT approach. And now, starting um, uh, uh, moving forward, we would actually like to not only educate, re-educate the people who were in the pilot um, with what we have learned around the CISNAT and use our trainers to do that, but we've also then uh, set ourselves up for hopefully for success by doing it right the first time across the five networks uh, in Edmonton Zone. And we will be open to other home care networks across Alberta if they will want to participate in this education. We've got coaching set up with the CISNAT team, so these three researchers are going to be available to us one month, two months, and five months after the education to, to uh, uh, provide support with both um, uh, 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 the ability of the trainers as well as implementation support. And then we are looking at organizing simultaneously um, team meetings and leadership support meetings because we would like to take a whole of organization approach. So I, I focus more on CISNAT and the uh, stakeholder engagement we've done in context of CISNAT. Um, however, as we submit our proposal, it is going to take a lot more um, as, as even the, the researchers who came to train us around CISNAT meant um, uh, 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 emphasize that we also need to recognize caregivers, we need to communicate with them in a timely manner, we need to partner with them, and then after the support needs assessment is done, we have to do the system navigation and resources, and for that we continue to use our caregiver-centered uh, competency framework which we have developed which actually addresses all these needs in the form of um, six domains. And this is something I've shared at the first presentation. So I think we have set ourselves up for success. We now to, we need to just persevere and continue our, um, our work. I'll Thank you so much, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. I, I didn't see questions come through, but certainly, folks, if you have them, uh, we can follow up post, and just a reminder, CISNAT is the Caregiver Support Needs Assessment Tool. 
a uh, tool that is used across the country, developed in Cambridge to assess and support caregivers. We're going to turn it over uh, swiftly here to Carol Fancott to talk about creating engagement capable environments. You've had two great examples of what a couple of teams are doing within the auspices of their improvement work, and, and Carol's going to set up this conversation about engagement more broadly. Carol. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Jen and Megan and team, for inviting me onto this webinar with all of you. And it has been fascinating to hear about the work happening within Priority Health uh, Innovation Challenges, and in particular, talking about um, engagement, stakeholder engagement plans. And I'm going to focus us and just start to whet your appetite in thinking about engagement-capable environments which is a term that really came out of work that we've done uh, at CFHI over the last decade in supporting healthcare organizations across Canada and health systems across Canada really think about how they are partnering, engaging and partnering with um, patients and families to make these improvements in care and processes of care and in systems of care. Um, and so, when, you know, in thinking about the stakeholder engagement challenge that's coming up, I invite you to reflect upon not only the roles, but when you are doing two, the groups that you've identified, when you are doing for them, and when you're doing with them. And I'm focusing particularly on the grouping of patients and families um, and community, but to really think of those with lived experience and what does it mean to be doing with. Um, sorry, I'm just navigating these arrows. Um, so at the foundation, you know, this word patient engagement has been out there for quite a while, and this is how we anchor ourselves in thinking about engagement. Um, and I invite you to read this um, definition, but focusing on you know, engagement happens in many, many ways, and it's meeting people where they're at, and we think of a wide range of activities. Um, we also recognize the expertise by experience that those people with lived experience bring and that we don't have as system leaders, as providers, and that it's important for us to understand the situation, the problem, the care, through multiple lenses, and it's only when that we have a full table um, around us can we really fully appreciate the expertise that all of us bring with the various hats that we wear, but in particular, the unique lens that patients and families bring. At the foundation, we also aim and we recognize there is a wide continuum of engagement strategies that we can use, but definitely um, in the work that we've been doing at the foundation, really think about it as collaboration and partnership. Many of you may be familiar with this model, and I just want to highlight, this is from Kristen Carmen and colleagues, and it's really been a great anchor for those of us that work in this area of engagement to just clearly articulate when we're talking about patient engagement and system improvement or in our quality improvement initiatives, we are landing in that red zone there, in that red bar of thinking about it at more the organizational or program level. Of course, there's engagement that happens at the direct level of care, and that's really what's happening between provider and patient and family. And when we talk about things like shared, shared decision making um, and specific aspects of care. And then um, we've seen engagement move into policy and in research and in other realms. But the work that we've done at the foundation and the work that we continue to support um, organizations to do across Canada really lands itself in that space of organizational design and governance. So moving on to be thinking about this different, this broad continuum. At the foundation, we talk about it as a mosaic of engagement methods, that there's no one single way to engage that's best, but it really depends on the purpose. And so I invite you to think about the purpose that you've articulated, because all of you, um, I recognize, uh, have been asked to have a patient and family advisor or partner as part of your quality improvement team. And I invite you to think about the purpose and the role that the patient advisor brings to your team and how that's been articulated. But also bearing in mind that this is one strategy, one method only. 
And what are the other ways by which you may invite in the perspectives of patients and families throughout the work that you're doing? And uh, the folks from Alberta may recognize this. This is from Alberta Health Services. But there's a wide range of strategies or methods that are used. And many of them are based on trying to understand the patient and family experience of care. What does that actually look like? Um, and then moving much more into active methods where they are part of your improvement teams, part of your decision-making tables. Um, through the work that we've done at the foundation, we, from, from what we have learned from all the teams that we've supported across the number of collaboratives that we've had related to patient engagement, but as well work that we've done in developing case studies um, in understanding what makes for meaningful engagement. And what we have found are three key pillars in particular that these organizations had in common that made for meaningful engagement in system improvements. Like any tripod, it can't stand on one leg or two legs on its own. It requires all three legs to be in place. And similar, where we call these pillars of really thinking about how have you prepared and, and um, recruited the patient partners that you're working with, but importantly as well, how is it that you have engaged staff and prepared staff for the engagement opportunity that is about to happen? And what is it that leaders do that support and bring strategic focus to um, the engagement activity? So there are many, um, many elements related to recruiting um, and orienting patient partners to the work at hand. And so for those of you that do have patient partners with you on your teams, if you reflect on the kinds of things that you may have done to help prepare your patient partner and to have those conversations about what their role looks like. Um, we have tip sheets that we've developed as a result of the work that we've done. And one of the key learnings that we've taken from um, the many uh, teams that we have worked with is the work that was actually needed to help prepare staff and providers in engaging with patients in this work at the program organization system level. And a lot of that work, um, again, is in these tip sheets that we um, uh, have developed, again, as a result of this work that we've done with uh, leaders, patients and families, and providers. And then lastly, taking a look at leaders that are able to walk the talk. Um, and this really is about the open listening, about welcoming other voices in, about not being in a defensive mode when feedback is provided, and thinking about shared leadership and shared decision making in how initiatives move forward and where improvements need to be made and the solutions that are brought forth. That, in a nutshell, is a little bit of the work of, that we've done in patient engagement and having you think about what is it that you're doing within your improvement teams now when you're thinking about your stakeholder engagement plans to create an engagement-capable environment. We have a ton of resources online. We have a patient engagement resource hub that has over 300 open source um, tools and resources that are very practical step-by-step -step toolkits that will lead you on this engagement journey as you are working together with patients and families. Lots of publications that we've had, two recent ones that are both published by Longwoods and, and again, openly available through our website. Um, and then also primers and webinars that are available. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Jim. Thank you, Carol. That was excellent, gang. We will be circulating these slides, and you'll see the links to those associated materials. You can certainly use those leading up to submitting your application for the mini challenge this Friday. But otherwise, this is, this is, this is good intel that you can use for your improvement work and engaging patients and families and, and others in, in your improvement work. I think it's such a critical point that Carol made of many critical points. You know, is this, is this for or with? Is it to or with? And really think about those areas of working with and in partnership and engagement. 
Um, I want to thank everybody. We're actually at the end of our call. These calls continue to be chock full of ideas. We're grateful for everyone who's joined our speakers today, Ali, who had to jump off, Madeline, Carol, the team leads, Jasneet, I know you speak for a broader team, and Jackie as well. Thank you for shedding some light on the work that you're doing. To our team that works behind the scenes uh, here at CFHI, thank you so much to make uh, this webinar a success. And then all of you, the, the chat box was on fire today. We heard uh, from many of you, including new folks. Lindsay's actually already been in contact with some of you via the chat box, and we'll be following up posts. We want to get more teams involved. And go ahead and fill out this poll. We'd love to hear what worked well, even better if, anything you'd like to hear on a future upcoming call. And now the time has come to a close. We'll end the second webinar in the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye for now, and we'll talk to you again soon. Good luck with the mini-challenge.